Hey, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jeff Baker. I'm the chair of Dr. Cog, and I'm going to be. I'd like to call us to order and ask if there's anybody that wants to make any public comment. Back in the room? Seeing none, hearing none. Do we have anybody online that would like to make public comment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't see any hands raised online or in person at this time. Very good. We'll go ahead and move on to agenda item number three, uh, the Regional Transportation Committee meeting summary from July 16th, 2024. If everyone has had a chance to read that, uh, if there are any corrections or changes that you would like to see made to those meeting summaries. I'm not hearing or seeing anyone. So we're going to go on to, we do have a quorum, correct, Cam? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Chair, we do have a quorum. Great. We're going to go ahead and move on to action items. Number four, the fiscal year 2024-2027 Transportation Improvement Program Amendments. And uh, Josh Schwenk is here to present for us. Good morning, Josh. Good morning. Thank you, Chair. Um, we do have several amend uh, proposed amendments to our transportation improvement program. Uh, the first is to our air quality improvement set aside. Uh, this set aside provides funding directly to the Regional Air Quality Council for some of their funds. Um, each uh, the funding from each tip is set up into a separate contract. And currently there is unspent funding in their uh, previous contract. So this would just roll over that unspent funding, $2 million in federal CMAQ funds uh, from the previous contract into the current contract for the current TIP. The next uh, would be to add a little over $23 million in federal capital investment grant funds for the East Colfax Bus Rapid Transit Project. Um, this would bring the total CIG funds for this project to $150 million. Uh, next, we have a new uh, Reconnecting Communities uh, Federal Discretionary Grant Project for Denver's uh, Reunited Denver Project in the GES neighborhoods, uh, totaling roughly $35.5 million in neighborhood access and equity funding. Next, we have several transfers of funding between projects in the TIP. Generally, when a project is listed in more than one location, we try to pull it out of those multiple listings and put it into one listing. So we are taking uh, $3.8 million from the Region 1 Bridge on System Pool and $21.5 million from the Region 1 Surface Treatment Pool and combining that funding into a new Interstate 25 resurfacing project. This is for the Central 25 uh, corridor. Additionally, we're adding in $1 million in strategic safety funds to that project as well. Um, happy to take any questions about any of these. Otherwise, I do have a proposed recommendation available for you in your packet. Are there any questions? Yes. Commissioner Guzman. I want to make sure it's on. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I'm curious about the new project uh, information for, sorry, I'm on the wrong section, uh, GES. Why is this new? I thought this project was already underway. Is this just a update to that project or are we adding it in? This is being added to the Transportation Improvement Program. This is um, a relatively new uh, federal discretionary grant award. Sometimes there's a delay between when the uh, federal announcement comes through and when we get permission to add that to the Transportation Improvement Program. So I think that's just the discrepancy there. Thank you. Yep. Other questions or concerns? Session? All right, Josh, can you put up the recommendation? Yes, one moment. Sure. I would entertain a motion. Okay, good morning, I'm sorry. Um, I'd like to move to recommend to the Board of Directors the attached proposed project amendments to the fiscal year 2024-2027 Transportation Improvement Program. 
motion has been made by um, Director Whitlow and seconded by Director Wheel. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. The next item on our agenda is also an action item. It's number five, the non-discrimination program update. Um, Alvin Badal Sanchez is our uh, presenter this morning. Good morning, Alvin. Good morning, Chair, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I will be discussing the regular three-year update to our non-discrimination program that we undertake. Um, there are four plans that make up our program, so I'll run through each of those uh, and what the update entailed for this cycle. We started this update back in April of this year, um, updating some of the data that goes into our various data sets, into our investment analysis. We moved into the summer actually updating our various documents, so those were three existing documents and one new one. Um, part of that document development also included making sure they were uh, fully remediated for accessibility. So by the time we did get into our public review period, which ran from mid-June to mid-July, we were putting out fully remediated, publicly accessible documents. Our public review period ended with a public hearing before our board in July. We've gone to TAC for a recommendation and received a unanimous recommendation to move forward. And so we are now here before you uh, to present the update and also hopefully receive a recommendation for our board. Like I mentioned, there are four plans that make up our program. Three existed prior to this update. That was our Title VI Implementation Plan, our Limited English Proficiency Plan, our Americans with Disabilities Act Program Access Plan. Each of those uh, we already had in place. These were just some updates that we undertook to uh, make sure they were in compliance with latest federal guidance and practices here at the agency. And then we do have a new plan, the Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Plan. This one only covers our Section 5310 program funding, so a small percentage of the funding that we allot here at the agency, but it is a first step for us, so excited to have this as part of our suite of plans and programs here. I'll run through what the update entailed for each of these documents uh, and then uh, end with what the public review period showed and what comments we received. I'll start with our Title VI plan. Uh, the major, one of the major pieces of the update included a demographic profile of the Denver region. Uh, we did change this. Previously, it was what we called our seven vulnerable populations. Now that we do have an equity index here at the agency, we transitioned this chapter into the 10 marginalized communities that make up that index. So on your screen right now is a screenshot of what one of those two-page spreads look like, in this case, people of color. For each of those 10 marginalized communities that are listed in the box, there is a two-page spread that shows how we define that community, how we get that data, what the breakdown is by county, as well as a map showing that distribution across our 10 county area. So for each of our 10 non-discrimination, 10 marginalized communities data sets, we do show a two-page spread just to show how that's a geographic distribution across our region. The second major piece of this update included updating our investment analysis. We used our most recent transportation improvement program as well as our recent equity index. And so we overlaid those projects um, by project type across our equity index to see how investment was shaking out across the region, whether we could start to discern any potential benefits, potential burdens as they were laying across the region. Our Title VI plan is our most expansive of our four. It also includes information around our policies and procedures that we have in place, our board and committee structure, how are decisions made, how can the public engage through that. Our staff divisions and major plans and programs, we've grown a lot in the last three years, so we did actually end up including quite a bit more information around this section, new teams, new products that we're developing, how we're making sure all of those are inclusive, accessible, non-discriminatory. Subrecipient monitoring, since we do pass through funds, making sure, making sure that our subrecipients are also in compliance with Title VI. What data are we using to make these decisions? And then outlining our principles around public participation that are part of our public engagement plan. Shifting to our limited English proficiency plan, this one also included an update. We provide an assessment of the region in terms of limited English proficiency. This one was more of a data update, just using what was most available to us during this cycle. Uh, in addition to that, we do provide county level breakdown, so you can see that for each county in our region, um, including the language identification flashcards that are available through the U.S. Census Bureau, and also providing a map of English language learners by school district. 
this one was more of a, a routine data update for us versus a significant um, overhaul or inclusion of new information compared to Title VI. Part of the limited English proficiency ass assessment is what we use a uh, four-factor analysis that comes down from our federal partners. So the number of LEP persons that will likely be encountered by our work, the frequency that they'll encounter our work, how important that work is to their lives, and then factor four, the resources available to us. So we cannot translate every um, document, every, every product into the languages that are spoken in the region. So how do we prioritize that in our decision-making process here at the agency? Our ADA program access plan uh, did include some significant updates, uh, primarily around our uh, response to the state's accessibility requirements. So there's a whole new uh, subchapter around all the work we've done as an agency to make sure our staff are trained uh, in accessibility remediation, have the tools available to them, um, what templates have we put out that are accessible. And so a lot of work at the agency is being captured in this, um, this new section within the ADA program access plan. This also includes just how we make sure our office space is accessible. While we don't own the building, we do make sure any renovations that are done to our space are compliant with the ADA. We have our new website out, making sure that's compliant. How do we ensure public meetings are accessible for people who can access different ways, different modes at different times? How is our planning process accessible? How do folk who have a disability, can, how can they engage in our decision-making process? And then just as with Title VI, making sure our subrecipients are also in compliance with the ADA, so also um, carrying forward those requirements in their contracts. And the last plan, like I mentioned, is our newest plan. It's our 5310 DBE plan. Uh, since we do expect to have contracts greater than 250000 this next fiscal year, um, we did create this plan. Uh, it outlines all of the reporting and monitoring requirements that we have, what our goal is as a region, any new forms and processes that we've established. So before this, we did have uh, what we call the DBE insert form. That was part of all of our requests for proposals. Um, as part of this update, we've uh, formalized the plan, have updated that form, and are, are moving forward with this as a new component of our non-discrimination program. Like I mentioned, we did have a public review that lasted 30 days. It ran from June 16th to July 17th. We promoted that on our website through website announcements, social media posts, and e-blasts. We also shared it with our partners and their civil rights divisions, CDOT, RTD, Federal Highway, and FTA for review and feedback. The only comments we did receive were from FTA civil rights staff, and so those were some uh, minor technical edits to the guidance we were showing in the DBE plan, making sure we had the latest available version, which was of April this year, and then also updating our DBE form to include a couple extra points of information just so we can track uh, firms a little better moving forward. Uh, but on your screen is uh, an example of that e-blast that went out to our partners. So just wrapping up with the schedule again, we're before y'all for a, a recommendation to the board. Um, ultimately, we'll be submitting this by October 1st to our federal partners to be in compliance with our typical three-year update cycle. We do have a proposed motion on the screen. Happy to take any questions, Chair. Thank you, Alvin. Uh, any questions or discussion? Of questions today. Alvin, what is the goal for the DBE? <clears throat> uh, 1.8 percent. So we took into account uh, the firms that are actually available in the region to do the work that we expect to be contracted out, and then we reviewed what other partners um, in the region and state were at, and so we also evaluated CDOTs and I believe um, Loveland's or Fort Collins DBE goals as well. Executive Director Johnson. Thank you very kindly. Good morning, all. I'm following up on Director Guzman's question because that raises the issue for me. Is this race neutral or race conscious, CB Eagle? The race neutral. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Commissioner Ubeck. I'm sorry, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, would you repeat the number again? I just missed the, it. Was it 11.8 or? 1.8. Sorry? 1.8. 1.8. Yes. Other questions? All right, I would entertain a motion. But does the chair normally, re oh, I guess. Director Guzman. I move to recommend to the Board of Directors adopt the Title VI Implementation Plan and the Associated Limited English Proficiency Plan, Americans with Disability Act Program Access Plan, and the Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Program Plan. Is there a second? Excellent. Second from, I can't read Our your name. Director Guzman. 
Director Silverstein. Thank you. All right, so we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, say nay. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. All right, we're going to move on to our discussion items. Number six, front range passenger rail update. Uh, Jacob Rieger is going to be giving us this update. Good morning, Jacob. Mr. Chair, just while they're getting set up and ready, just to the last item, I just did want to inform the committee that at next month's meeting, we do plan on doing a deeper dive informational item into the details of our new DPE program. So just wanted to let. Thank you, Ron. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Jacob Rieger, Dr. Cog staff. I actually just have the easy job of introducing our speaker, but just a little bit of context for this item. The Front Range Passenger Rail District Board has been working since about middle of 2022. They've been engaged in a lot of activities since that time. Um, they have spoken to you before a few months ago. We thought it was timely to give another update. There's a lot going on both within the district um, and within um, the recent legislative session. There were several bills that passed um, that affect the district's work. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Chrissy Bright, who's the Chief of Staff for the Front Range Passenger Rail District Board. Do I press? Okay, thank you all so much for having me. As Jacob mentioned, I was here about a year ago and I'm excited to be back with you all today and hopefully doing the AV correctly. Okay, so my agenda for today is um, simple yet complex. I wanna give a refresher to those that are new to the conversation about what Front Range Passenger Rail is, um, provide some project updates since I was here a year ago, talk about the recent legislative session, and then also look at our district accomplishments from the last year and what we're looking for the two years ahead from now. Okay, so I'm gonna begin with a video that I've told I pull up this one. Play. The Colorado Front Range, where the Great Plains meet the Rocky Mountains, where cities, towns, and neighborhoods each have a unique character, yet all share the legacy of a pioneering spirit and a belief in what's possible where world-class educational institutions are making groundbreaking discoveries and preparing the next generation to lead. It's a place where people want to be. And for the five million of us who are lucky enough to live, work, play, and raise families here, it's home. Over the next 25 years, Colorado's population is on track to nearly double as we grow by more than three million people, and most of them will have cars. This growing population presents new challenges like making sure we can keep Coloradans moving when our roads just weren't built for this many cars. Yet in this challenge, we see possibility. At this key moment in our state's history, we have a once in a lifetime opportunity to build a new way to connect Coloradans. A new way to travel along the front range that's fast, safe, reliable, and comfortable. Front Range Passenger Rail will provide an opportunity to link communities across the front range with modern and efficient passenger rail service. From the Chile Festival in Pueblo to the U.S. Olympic Museum in Pikes Peak in Colorado Springs, basketball, football, baseball, and hockey games in Denver, from Boulder's Flatirons and Pearl Street Mall to the nationally recognized breweries of Fort Collins. Intercity passenger rail service along the front range will connect Coloradans to opportunities, adventure, and each other. Now, with new sources of federal funding and a commitment from state leaders and local communities, Colorado is at an exciting juncture, and front range passenger rail service is within reach. Join us as we unlock new opportunities to connect with one another and chart a new path forward to meet the transportation needs of tomorrow. Celebrities like Justin Bieber and The Rock Everyone. generate hundreds of millions of dollars. It's actually not what you think. They as far as my tech support goes. Sorry, guys. That's perfect. 
All right, we're back on track. Um, okay, so in terms of why Front Range Passenger Rail, we have a vision for safe, efficient, reliable travel along the Front Range, supporting job growth and local economic development, mitigating congestion and supporting our state's air quality goals, and expanding access to housing and employment options. Uh, what is FRPR? What is the current proposal? So we are looking to use existing freight tracks, which helps us minimize costs and expedite the service start date. Nine initial primary stations from Fort Collins through Denver down to Pueblo. We have a long-term statutory direction of connecting to Wyoming and New Mexico in the future. Um, we are working towards a goal of six daily round trips, Pueblo to Fort Collins by 2035. Uh, talking about intercity passenger rail is interesting in Colorado because we don't have it. And so it's different than light rail, different than commuter rail, um, and we're looking at a, kind of a max speed of probably 79 miles per hour, which means that right now it's a travel time estimate from Pueblo to Fort Collins of just over three hours. Um, as Jacob mentioned, I'm from the Front Range Passenger Rail District, joined today by our directors, Deborah Mulvey and Deborah Johnson. Good to see you all. Um, we were created by the Colorado Legislature in 2021, stood up in 2022. We're the largest special district in the state. Um, and we are really working towards um, raising the sustainable funding needed to make this project happen. So we are empowered to raise um, a tax by the vote of the people in the district, which is that blue area um, shown on the map. Okay. Um, so we had a big announcement at the end of last year whereby um, the bipartisan infrastructure law created a brand new program called Corridor Identification Development Program. It's a comprehensive inner city kind of incubation to create new passenger rail programs throughout the country. Um, again, we kept it into December 2023. And what it means is that we're in a preferential position to receive um, federal funding to complete the planning and NEPA work. So at a competitive match of 80 federal to about 20 local. So um, pretty exciting thing. We had the FRA administrator out to Denver to join us at our press conference. Uh, actual project development work. So again, we are working through our federal service development plan, which is on track to be completed um, towards the end of next year. We have completed route, station area, ridership analyses. Right now we're doing the really complex operational modeling with the host railroads. I uh, actually had a full day workshop on Thursday of last week to look at when you introduce passenger you know, flows to the freight network, how do you um, how do you mitigate any kind of impacts and how sort of what level of infrastructure is needed? Um, out of that work will come kind of the capital project costs, O&M costs, and implementation plans. We are excited. Uh, likely end of this year, possibly very beginning of next year, will be a big public outreach opportunity where we'll be showing our alternatives analysis. Um, to learn more about that, your best way to stay up to date is to go to ridethefrontrange.com, which is our website, and then to register for the mailing list there. In addition to the federal um, planning process, we're also doing local station area outreach. Um, as I mentioned earlier, nine primary markets have been identified for stations. We're working with the locals to pinpoint where that actual kind of intersection is in their communities. Um, and our goal is to pinpoint those nine primary stations um, by the spring of 26. Okay, as Jacob mentioned, it was a very busy legislative session this year. Um, three primary bills that interface with Front Range Passenger Rail. One, very simple, we had an administrative cleanup bill, House Bill 1012. Uh, second one is SB 184, which is the bill that raises new rental car fees to fund um, inner city rail and transit projects and as well as kind of um, gives direction for Front Range Passenger Rail District, RTD, CDOT, CTIO to work together to advance um, nearer term rail service between Denver and Fort Collins. And then the last bill to speak of is SB 230, which levies new um, fees on oil and gas production to support uh, existing and new transit and rail services. Um, again, SB 24184 collects the rental car fees and ostensibly is available for three primary uses right now. One is busting, which is CDOT's kind of operated inner city bus service, front range passenger rail and mountain rail. Um, as of right now, the fiscal note has projections of about $58 million a year of revenue beginning in late 25 that can be used to support these kind of three enterprises. Um, as of now, it's really intended to go towards project level funding, capital costs, and not for kind of either administrative operations or service operations. Um, the bill, again, kind of directs these entities to work together. And so there are working groups that are actively happening amongst the entities, 
a governance, a finance, operations groups, and really the intent is to kind of bridge the linkage between fast tracks planning and front range passenger rail planning to advance sort of a nearer term service plan that can bring rail service um, north. I think from a district perspective, I want to add that these new fee revenues are historic and really exciting and a, and a great kind of development for Colorado. Um, but in the same time, in terms of our perspective of trying to bring a full quarter project from Pueblo to Fort Collins, um, we, more money will be needed. It's a local taxi initiative for the district will be needed to actually operate and sustain a um, competitive, viable service. Okay, so as Jacob mentioned, a lot has been going on over the past year or two. As I mentioned on the previous slide, we were accepted into the federal quarter ID program. Our district board has adopted the route and station markets for the future service. That station location criteria has been finalized. We've done extensive outreach throughout the entire corridor. Um, we've had meetings all the way from Trinidad to Cheyenne, so even beyond the corridor. Um, for those that maybe haven't heard about it, there was a... Out. Our executive director um, needed to get a ride back from uh, Longmont to Denver for a presentation that evening, and the train that was being run, which was operating at freight speeds, actually got back to Denver before he did. So um, as we improve the corridor, it's going to be a very viable service, and it's really exciting to kind of have that experience. Additionally, we did public opinion polling last year and showed that there's a strong support for the project and charts our course for a communications plan. And then lastly, we did some preliminary financial modeling to evaluate kind of service costs and sales tax ask of voters in the future. All right, Jacob also asked me specifically to speak on ballot timing. Um, our board evaluated going to the ballot in 2024 this year to raise the tax for um, implementing the service and sustaining it. Um, our board evaluated a lot of information through workshops and community input and decided to pursue a ballot measure in a future year, um, 2026. Some of the reasons for that is really wanting to make sure that we shore up the project definition and have that federal service development plan completed before going to the ballot. Um, additionally, with the introduction of 184 to the legislative developments, really wanting to make sure that we um, capitalize upon those new funding sources and really best leverage that so that we can buy down the ask when we go to the voters. And so we are excited to be working towards the 26th ballot initiative, continuing our outreach and coalition building with communities and local governments. Okay, two-year look ahead. Obviously, ballot initiative, as I've said more than once now, um, completing our service development plan, getting through the environmental clearance process, host railroad agreements, um, community outreach, coalition building, variety of tasks like that is what we're looking to be doing. Um, again, what's the why? Inner city passenger rail, it's fast, it's safe, and it's reliable. Um, with the federal funding available, it's a really unique opportunity to advance this project, um, and that we're excited to serve Coloradoans' needs now and in the future. And I am happy to take any questions. Questions? I did not realize it. It's okay. Thank you so much for the overview. It's yeah. really exciting and I cannot wait. I'm really excited that this is happening in my lifetime. Uh, my question is regarding the, um, the funding way. Are there other alternatives being looked at other than sales tax? I guess my only worry is that it's so regressive for low-income communities and so I would just hate for low-income communities to be the ones bearing the brunt of this. Yeah, absolutely. So um, as I mentioned earlier, there has been some new state fees that have been generated that can be used to support the cost of the project. Um, our district has the ability to also raise, um, in addition to sales tax, property taxes, but I think that <laughs> in this state, the uh, sales tax felt more viable. And so again, we are also trying to prioritize taking advantage of the federal grant opportunities right now to support what we can get to really minimize that um, the support from our local residents. Sorry, I should have clarified yeah. of this specifically for what will come on the ballot for mm -hmm. voters. Same answer, right? So it's the capital, it's looking to the federal grant support, it's looking to um, sort of those kind of opportunities. But it looks like Director Mulvey, Deborah Mulvey wants to add in. Uh, yeah, I, if I may, as a member of the board, um, I can add that the taxation district for the sales tracks is quite large. 
And so it wouldn't be centered solely on the communities um, that might be of concern. It really goes the entire length as well as a big bump out for um, Arapahoe and Douglas and a big bump out for Boulder. Director Guzman and then Director Adams. So do we know how much money is left for rail projects from what was set aside in the last round of federal funding? One question. Um, a lot of that money has been spent, so I don't know what's left to be able to draw down, and I'm concerned about that if that's the, the money that you're banking on. Second thing is, when will the service development plan be finished? Absolutely. So in regards to how much federal funding is left, I think to your point, it is, it is, th there's appropriations available left through 2026, which we know will be, you know, here really soon. We know a lot of it has been appropriated. I think that I don't have the exact amount currently available, um, but that is also, again, why we're looking at this collective opportunities for funding beyond just looking for federal support. And then the service development plan anticipated to be completed at the end of next year. I'm sorry, I think Director Holkeen had a I'm sorry. follow up. No? Okay. Yes. Uh, this is, look, I understand you can't do everything when you're trying to take an ambitious project like this on. The question I have is what's, what's the messaging to the constituents in our state who are south of where the line's going to initially come in, the Fort Collins to, to Denver? Segment. What are we gonna? What's the messaging? So if someone comes to me about Front Range Passenger Rail, what am I communicating to them about the fact that they may wait ten years before they see any benefit from this? So what's the messaging? What do, What do we? Again, and I realize you can't do you can't do what we would really like to do, but so what are we telling people? Um, I can tell you what I'm telling people, and then again, if um... Director Mulvey, you want to add? I know, I know, I saw eye contact there, so we can we can tag team it. Um, a few things, right? I think you're absolutely right in that a mega project of this nature it takes time and it takes phasing, and so unfortunately, that's just kind of how it rolls out. Um, because there has been taxes collected from communities north of Denver for a train. It is hard to advance a rail conversation without showing some movement in that part first. And there's also been more mature planning work there to date. And so it's really wanting to capitalize upon investment and time that's been used so that we can move things along. I think that the reason that the Front Range Passenger Rail District was created was for this focus on ensuring round, you know, this full kind of front range connection. And that remains a key priority of our board and a key thing that we are working towards and committed to. Director Mulvey. Push the wrong one. Uh, thank you for that question because we do both serve the same area and there, there is a, a good representation from the South, the South South um, on the board, a little bit less for South Metro, which is your area commissioner. Uh, the messaging is several pieces. The legislation, the enabling legislation requires the Front Range Passenger Rail District to do the Northern area first. So the messaging is, let's get the other areas ready. That can include, include station planning, that can include communication with the um, potential users to see what they're interested in doing. And then the, the very specific part of where is this station going to be, which is the main conversation in your and my area. Dr. Broom. Thank you. I had a question. It's just kind of obvious. It doesn't include. International Airport, and that's a huge traffic generator. I, I, know, I can realize it would be difficult if you come in from the north, if you tear off and go out to the airport and then tear into uh, station, but like we're missing the boat here by not uh, some way to the airport. All the papers over the weekend, huge traveler numbers generated out of there, and those people already trying to get somewhere in Colorado. 
Yeah, so I guess two thoughts on that is that one, I do feel like front range passenger rail commuters and travelers would be served because of the fabulous A-line service that, you know, RTD operates. So I think there is that connectivity. Um, our service will stop at Union Station. People can easily transfer to the um, A-line to the airport. And additionally, because we're looking to be using existing freight tracks, those don't exist out to the airport right now. So we are trying to advance where we can most fastidiously connect the major population communities, and that's those tracks that are um, unfortunately don't go to the airport. Dr. Silverstein. Well, thank you. And um, more um, questions about connectivity. Yeah. I'm sure we have the, the comment about the airport. What is the district doing to facilitate connectivity along the um, the? Yeah, absolutely. So actually, our rail planner um, is leading a workshop through CASTA uh, in October that is really intended to be bringing together local transit providers and local communities um, to kind of begin some of those conversations about connectivity. Um, it's challenging to me because we are going to be the backbone, right? We're the spine. And obviously, we recognize how important the vessels are for the sustainability of the service and for viability for communities. I think at the same time, we are really focused on getting the backbone right and then working with our partners and local communities to help build out those transit and pedestrian and bike connectivity. Um, I would also just add that if there are any communities that ever want to speak with us and kind of share their ideas and their, you know, their needs, we are always happy to have those kind of meetings or conversations, present to your groups, hear from your groups, that kind of thing. Other questions? Director Kuzma. Sorry, I have one more. Um, oh, that's good. <laughs> what what does the conversation with the private railroad owners look like? If these are on existing freight railroads, mm -hmm. I mean, that's not public property. Is the state assisting to facilitate those conversations, leaning in to get that work done, or are they leaving you to do it on your own? Uh, I'm just curious because you don't own them, we don't own them as a public right of way. And so in order to use them, to update them, it's you're completely reliant on the actual real owner of those planes. Yeah, absolutely. So I was in a seven hour workshop on Thursday of last week that had representation from my organization, the district, um, we had CDOT staff and we had people from Union Pacific and BNSF that flew in for the meeting. And so we are actively coordinating through the Federal Service Development Plan and there is data sharing happening and an actual kind of regular monthly meetings to facilitate this project. Mayor Mills. Thank you, Chair. Um, what is the, you, you said you want to go after sales tax here, but what is the rate you're trying to get? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, again, I think because there are some new state fees available, we're trying to right size the ask to make sure we ask the, enough, but not too much of our voters. When we were doing some preliminary financial analysis beginning of this year, we were looking at a 0 0.23. 0 0.23. And I ask that because there are a lot of communities that have a pretty sizable tax compared to many others. Uh, up north, a lot of our communities are about 8.5%. Denver, um, Denver, when you have the combined sales tax, you're about 8.81. And the voters in Denver are actually being asked to increase that for Denver Health and other programs. And so that might be a tough ask for a lot of folks when they're already being taxed up to a point where you could be crossing the 10% mark if if other measures pass later this year and, and, and continue on with what you want to pass. So that will be a hard ask for a lot of folks. People in my community would likely say no. They already said no to other sales tax increases for really public safety, and we're about 8.5% over in my community. We're not going to benefit with the, with the passenger rail. Um, Mayor Mills, remind me where you're from. Brighton. Okay, yeah, I hear you. Other questions, concerns? Ron. I see Ron Papsdorf, Transportation Planning Director, Dr. Cog, for the record. Thanks so much for being here. Really, really exciting opportunity, uh, a new addition to the transportation system. The funding piece, <clears throat> I think, uh, is of interest of the, for this region and should be an interest for the folks around this table. You mentioned Senate Bill 230, which is, you know, really important. Um, uh, of the last legislative session, and this may be outside of your wheelhouse, but I think the question for this table should be the decision making around the distribution of the funding from Senate Bill 230 because it was not intended just for passenger rail, right? And I think 
our our regional mass transit system RTD should look to benefit from that revenue from Senate Bill 230 as well. So I'm curious about the discussions, who's having the discussions around the distribution of that Senate Bill 230 funding between sort of the passenger rail initiatives, multiple projects, not just front range passenger rail, and sort of local mass transit systems like RTD and other transit systems around. Yeah, thank you for the question. I will give you my response and then Director Johnson, Gentleman Andrew Johnson, if you want to chime in, I would welcome you to do so. Um, my understanding, right, so 230 creates new funding for the clean transit enterprise is that it's very much still being worked out. I think these were just created legislatively a few months ago. This creates whole new structures within large departments and agencies, and it's still being understood how this will function and how it will be appropriated. I know a portion of it is a competitive grant program. Um, from my perspective, we haven't been part of conversations yet that talk about how it'll be prioritized and how it'll be allocated. Executive Director Johnson. Thank you very kindly. I would echo uh, the comments that Chrissy just put forward. It's yet to be determined. And so we too are waiting to understand what the process will be in recognizing there will be a portion set aside from discretion for discretionary grants as well. Thanks. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Dr. Mulvey. I can add one piece. Um, there is a working group on this process that's doing the stand-up of the SB 184 process, and it recognizes that there are three categories and not just rail, and that existing programs and grantees like RTD can't be left in the lurch, um, and that it should be shared. I think that's probably the best way to put it at this point, and the working group is under development. It includes a variety of stakeholders and decision makers, CDOT, Governor, Front Range Passenger Rail, and CTIO. Thank you. All right. Any last questions, and then we need to move on. All right. Thank you so much, Chrissy. Thank you we very much. We appreciate it. There's always something new every time she presents to us. Huh? <laughs> so I either through questions or whatever. There's, I always learn something. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is South Boulder Road and Alameda Avenue Corridor Studies Final Report. And we have Nora Kern here. She is the Sub Area and Project Planning Program Manager. Good morning. Good morning, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, so I'm here to kind of wrap up and share some of the highlights from our pilot quarter planning program. So this has been something we've been working on the last couple of years. You've, you've probably heard about it before, and we have now completed our first two studies, so wanted to share some of the, the key t takeaways from those efforts. So just a reminder, um, this is our um, quarter planning program, which is really focused on advancing the projects that are outlined in the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. You can see a snapshot of what those projects are on the right currently in the current plan. Um, and so this is kind of a new effort for Dr. Cog, where we really are taking a, on a more of a leadership role in actually uh, doing the planning work, working with our regional partners and, and local stakeholders to really advance some of these projects. So with the pilot started in 2022, we had a, the two first studies were the Alameda Quarter Study and the South Boulder Road Study. Um, and since then, this program has kind of been formalized as a set aside in the 2024 Transportation Improvement Program. So lots of lessons learned from these kind of first projects we'll be carrying forward into the future ones. So um, just wanted to talk a little bit about these two first studies that we have completed. Um, each of them were, they were different projects but followed a fairly similar planning process. So we did have a project management committee which consisted of all the local governments along each corridor um, as well as RTD and CDOT on, on one of the two. Um, we also had a steering committee um, and then kind of followed the general process of looking at the existing conditions, developing some goals, engaging with the community and key stakeholders and then developing some recommendations and next steps. So the South Boulder Road Corridor study I'll just start with. Um, this was a study we worked in partnership with the city of Boulder, Boulder County, the cities of Louisville and Lafayette, um, as well as RTD. Um, and this corridor is identified currently in the Regional Transportation Plan as a um, priority 
uh, transit corridor. Um, as many know, it's also recommended for uh, potential BRT in the future through the Northwest Air Area Mobility Study. And so when we kind of started this um, effort, we were really looking at kind of the long-term forecast for this corridor, both how it's operating today and issues today, but also what's kind of the, the future look like on this corridor. Some of the key things we looked at were travel patterns, um, as well as demographics and forecasted land use. Um, kind of some of the big takeaways there are not surprisingly, we are anticipating a lot of growth, particularly on the eastern end of this corridor. That's also currently where some of the higher uh, equity index scores and folks with lower incomes um, are currently living. Um, and currently, especially on the eastern end, this is really operating as a local corridor. People are using it to get around to their kind of key needs. Um, but at the farther west you go, you kind of see longer trips as people make that more regional commute into Boulder. So safety was a key focus of this corridor. And you can see there's a number of locations that were identified as high um, crash locations with the high level of safety service. Um, we also looked at transit. And so the dash um, in particular, you can see we looked at kind of where the bus is currently slowing down, opportunities to get the bus moving. Um, not surprisingly, as you kind of get into Boulder, there's a lot of slowdowns, especially during um, congestion and, and traffic time periods, but we're also seeing some congestion on the eastern end as it kind of turns into Louisville and goes through Lafayette. Um, we did have two phases of engagement. The first was focused on really understanding what's going on in this corridor, what are the, the challenges and issues people are currently experiencing. And then our second phase was focused on bringing some ideas back to the community to um, see if they're resonating and, and kind of meeting what folks were looking for. Um, I will note with this quarter as well as the Alameda quarter, this is kind of a first step study. So we were kind of just trying to get the conversation going. Um, and so you'll see in our vision, it is a little high level. You know, we are looking um, at, at the future, creating a transportation framework that prioritizes safety and mobility, um, a number of kind of sub goals. But again, this is kind of a first step trying to set that vision and bring um, all the partners to the table to think about how this vision can be realized. So our recommendations, I will say we do have the final plan. It's, it's currently completing remediation, but if you would like to see it, we have it available and we'd be happy to share. Um, we have a number of kind of more detailed recommendations um, that are particularly related to safety. Um, we also are recommending um, the exploration of a, a continuous bikeway route along the whole corridor, kind of improving it where there's currently no route or kind of substandard um, bikeway facilities. And then the other big corridor recommendation here is to continue the conversation to look at improving transit on this corridor. Um, the dash is currently a very um, well used and kind of key connection, um, but there's a lot of support in the region to really advancing the transit um, and looking at dedicated right of way in some areas and just generally improving speed reliability um, and kind of traveler amenities. Um, so the Alameda corridor study, again, I'll kind of just speed through this. It went through a fairly similar process. It is a very different corridor. So for this corridor, we're looking at Alameda from um, Wadsworth um, and Lakewood all the way out to the R line. So it's 14 miles. We worked uh, very closely with Lakewood, Denver, Aurora, RTD, um, and CDOT. So a big group for this one. Um, the Alameda corridor is identified for bus rapid transit, as most, most folks know. Um, in the 2030 to 39 staging period. It's also in Denver Moves um, Transit identified for BRT. And there's a number of really significant ongoing projects along the corridor that we wanted to make sure that we were kind of incorporating into our analysis. So just two examples of those are the Denver Moves Cherry Creek plan. Um, and then Dottie is also working on a road diet, which we heard a lot about just because it's kind of concurrently going on right now. Um, we did look at demographics and travel patterns as well. Um, there are significant equity populations along this corridor, particularly in West Denver and out in Aurora. Um, and I think maybe not surprising to folks who have traveled along Alameda, you know, it, it isn't really a corridor people are traveling from Lakewood to Aurora on. It's really much more about those kind of couple mile trips getting um, within the region and within the, the different communities. So that's kind of an important consideration. Um, crashes, again, this is on the high injury network for the region. Um, we saw particularly severe crashes in the west and in the, the east um, kind of aurora sections of the corridor. Um, we also looked at a number of things, including transit um, and transit delay to kind of see where the bus is getting hung up. Um, and so this is the delay between the stops so you can really see the bus as it approaches 
um, the major intersections is getting hung up in traffic. So that gives some idea of where some pinch points and some, some places where um, we will want to prioritize improvements as we look towards BRT in the future. Um, similarly to engagement phases, um, heard a lot of, this is a map of where all the different spots we were out talking to folks. So really tried to cover the whole corridor and, and be in all the different jurisdictions. Um, had a lot of really great feedback throughout. Um, we did establish kind of a vision. And again, this is a, a fairly high level study. So we're really just trying to kind of set the stage for future projects. But you can see some of the priorities here that the group um, felt were really important. Um, one kind of key area here is that we want to unite the communities and preserve their character, but emphasize transit as a primary mode, and above all, support safe and comfortable mobility for everybody. So that kind of reflects the transit priority um, that a lot of people felt was really important to highlight on this corridor. Um, so for the Alameda recommendations, because it is identified as a future bus rapid transit corridor, we didn't dive into all the details of, you know, center lane, center lane um, outside lane, where it's in a dedicated right of way, where it might be in mixed traffic. Um, but we really wanted to set up kind of for the next step, which would probably be an alternatives analysis, really diving into some of those questions. Um, we did see a lot of support for bus rapid transit, so wanted to advance that recommendation. We started to kind of look at where some potential BRT stops may fall so that we can kind of coordinate and make sure we're prioritizing other recommendations in those area. Um, and then the other thing you'll see on this map is Alameda is really critical because of how many connections it has. It's one of the few kind of continuous east-west corridors, particularly for transit riders. So those connections to um, Sheridan, to Federal, to you know the DEH light rail, um, all the way out to the R line are really important because that's kind of how people are navigating and connecting the east-west with the, nor the north-south travel. Um, in addition to the bus rapid transit kind of um, recommendations, we did also look at a number of kind of more specific safety and mobility recommendations. They kind of fall into these seven different categories. Um, the corridor is really different from east to west, so obviously the, the level of recommendations and the type of re types of recommendations definitely varied. Um, and we tried to kind of tailor these to um, what we were hearing in each segment. Um, we divided the corridor into six segments um, and aligned them with what the local jurisdictions are either already had planned or were working on um, in the coming years. So that was a really quick synopsis. Um, I tried to kind of run through those. Again, we have both of these um, plans complete, kind of going through final remediation. If you'd like to look through them, um, I'd be happy to share them. So feel free to reach out. Um, looking ahead for the quarter program, um, as it kind of is formalized now in the, the tip set aside, we have two upcoming projects which should be starting fairly imminently. Um, so the first is the East Colfax Bus Rapid Transit Extension um, Alternatives Analysis, so looking at BRT from 225 out to E470. And then the second is our Sheridan Quarter Safety Study. Um, and then last, we do have our call for projects for the remaining two years of the TIP set aside for this program next summer. So looking forward to kind of thinking um, what's next in the, in the coming months for the program. So with that, happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you, Nora. I would just, uh, there's her contact information. I was going to ask you to put that up. So yep, that, there it is, right there. So <laughs> that uh, those people that do want copies, I think they were provided a copy of your presentation. Yes. But the actual studies, if anyone needs those, that's how to get those, nkern at drcog.org. Definitely. And for the, I think many, many folks have staff or, or colleagues on our um, technical advisory committee. So we'll be also sending out the final, final version once we have those to, to all those groups. Great. Questions? Director Guzman. A lot to say today. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Nora, really, really kudos to you. This is Yeoman's work. Um, <laughs> I worked with you on the Alameda Corridor Study Project just for the section that was relevant to where I direct on the RTD board and the amount of detail and concern, a lot of listening to all parts, and I, 13 different segments on this corridor. There, there were six for the Alameda, but they were yeah. six mighty ones for sure. Yeah. <laughs> it felt like a thousand. Yeah. Um, but you, you were listening through Dr. Cog's process to what everybody had to say and allowing the opportunity for community to really get involved and dig in. And, and there's a lot, like you said, a lot of diversity along this route. Um, so the process was for everybody else's edification really well done 
and I appreciate the hard work that you have put into it and your team. Um, it shows. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I appreciate that. It was great to get everybody together. And, and I think that's kind of the unique part of this program is a lot of these jurisdictions haven't, we haven't all worked on these corridors together. So really getting to get the regional process was really helpful. Questions? I have a comment, just a real quick comment, because Arapahoe County's Department of Human Services is on Alameda, just east of 225. And of course, we have citizens from all over Arapahoe County going there to, to get their, um, their, their cards, their commodities, and receive services. And I think it's critical, and I, I do want to compliment RTD, because I know you've got a big um, stop and go there, stop and ride, and park and ride, and it really has served that community well. So thank you for all that. Any other questions or concerns? Uh, Mayor Mills. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and, and I recognize all the needs for, you know, Alameda, South Boulder Road. I'm familiar with those corridors, but um, we, I'm on the Highway 7 Coalition, and there's been a big push for so long to get BRT, a BRT route between Brighton and Boulder, and I don't even see that on the radar with any time I see these presentations. Any comment as to when that can actually be on the radar for this to be something that's more of a reality in the future, not just a dream. Yeah, well, I'm not an expert in all the history of um, CO7. I know a lot is happening, and it is currently in the Regional Transportation Plan. Um, so I know a lot of folks kind of in the in the Boulder and, and North Metro region have been working really hard on that. Um, there is significant funding for it currently in the plan. And we also will be working with Brighton um, upcoming very shortly on kind of just the court, the Bridge Street kind of connection and how CO7 connects into um, Brighton itself. So um, I don't I think, you know, generally it's, it's in the plan that I know lots of folks are working on. I don't know if Ron or Jacob have anything else they want to add, but um, Director yeah. Papsdorf. Thank you. Thank you, Nora. Uh, Mayor Mills, as we've talked about before. So Colorado 7, very important transit corridor. It's identified as a transit corridor in the Dr. Cog Regional Transportation Plan now. It is not currently identified as a bus rapid transit corridor in the Regional Transportation Plan. Um, we will be engaging in an update to our Regional Transportation Plan beginning um, towards the end of this year for and then about a year and a half to two year process. So we'll be evaluating lots of priorities around the region to do that. Um, Dr. Cog has allocated funding through the Transportation Improvement Program for startup transit service in the State Highway Corridor, uh, State, State Highway 7 Corridor. So there are efforts underway to improve and expand transit service. It's just not yet identified as a bus rapid transit corridor. We've got, we've got 11 corridors identified in the Regional Transportation Plan now. We're really trying to move those forward. But every time we update the Regional Transportation Plan, it's a new opportunity to evaluate those priorities think about how we align what what the right sort of transit investment is in a particular corridor with the needs throughout the region and the benefits and the local jurisdiction efforts to um, look at what they can do to help support those kinds of transit investments right because we we definitely as a region I think would agree that we don't necessarily want to put the wrong kind of transit system or service into a corridor that's not going to be successful ultimately. So uh, lots of considerations, but the next RTP update will be the, be the opportunity to sort of evaluate those, those priorities and those alternatives. I couldn't let a presentation like this go without mentioning this. Understand. You will continue to get the same answer from me, Mayor Mills. <laughs> thank, thank you for bringing it up. We, we, we keep it going so it's actually in the, in the forefront and not just a dream in the future. Thank you. Any other comments or concerns? All right. Thank you, Nora. We appreciate Great, your presentation. We're going to go to administrative items now for our member comments. Anyone that would like to comment? We'll go to CDOT first. I'm not sure who would be Director Holguin. Um, quickly, we have a very full week this week. Uh, we're doing um, our commission workshop start tomorrow and all day Thursday. This is a very unique month because there's a field trip 
attached to it. So it is two very full days. Um, so for the workshops, we have um, a traditional budget workshops that we have every month, um, some updates on current projects. And then the bus tour, which will um, give uh, commissioners an opportunity, especially new commissioners, an opportunity to see the Johnson Memorial Eisenhower the Eisenhower Memorial Tunnel, um, and just be able to see the entire operation and what a masterpiece it is. So I'm really excited. I unfortunately won't be able to make it. I have another commitment, but I'm really excited for the, the rest of the commissioners because it is a wonderful opportunity. Um, the Thursday meeting will be held in Grand Junction and, um, and then continuing the route with all the projects alongside. So um, so really exciting month. Um, I will also share that the uh, Colorado Boulevard BRT uh, community engagement process has started. And so hopefully, if you did not attend the, the session last week, there is an opportunity to provide some feedback. The survey will be open until September 27th. So it would be great to get your feedback and input on that. And other than that, I'll hand it over to Commissioner Adams. See there's anything else? Uh, just to uh, add a couple of uh, comments to uh, Commissioner Hogan's uh, comments, uh, I do think this uh, this field trip is a great opportunity for CDOT commissioners to actually see projects. You know, and Commissioner Hogan mentioned some of the ones, but it's more than that. They plan on making stops quite a bit along the way. Unfortunately, I, I'm in Washington, D.C. At a, at a White House event tomorrow. And, and the rest of the week, so I'll miss it as well. But, but it, I think it is important to note that the time is being taken to really uh, give the commissioners a good insight of projects and people, by the way, because it is an opportunity for them to meet with other people from throughout the state as well as CDOT staff. So that's part of the intent. Um, I, I won't comment on uh, Senate Bill uh, 184. I think we talked about that. And we, you know, I sit on uh, CTIO's board and on as a commissioner, so we're we're well aware of the opportunity and the challenge of execution. There, there are big reports that are due and big objectives that we have to reach by the end of the year. So, so there are things that we have to get done. Uh, I don't think that um, I should let a meeting like this go without talking about the two unfortunate deaths that we have within CDOT. And, you know, we've taken a lot of time and talked a lot about what I would call safety on our roads. And, you know, we've tried to focus within CDOT, and I know RTD worries about this too, is work, is, uh, work zone safety. And while this wasn't necessarily, as I see it, a, a, a clear work zone issue, but it is important that travelers are, are alert and aware of our employees as they're working on the road and putting their lives in danger, and so, uh, so I just, uh, it, it is unfortunate that it happened, um, but it, it's really a tragedy. And, and I hope we don't experience this again, any place for any employees with any of the organizations within the state. Uh, my first that I've had to deal with since I've been on CDOT Sport, but it is difficult. Uh, the last thing I wanna mention is I wanna thank uh, all of you. I was at the dinner the Metro Denver Vision Dinner, in which Karen Stewart, and it's unfortunate she's not here today, but uh, in which Karen Stewart was recognized. And she was, uh, for those of you who weren't there, it was such a joy to see someone like Karen being caught at a loss for words. <laughs> and that really doesn't happen very often, but it was, uh, I thought it was very special, and I'm glad I was able to attend. Thank you, Skyler. Or any really struggling with this, I would I would echo Commissioner Adams' condolences for the lost CDOT employees. I would also say for those involved with local and state government entities, we last year strengthened Colorado's slow down move over laws to be the toughest standard you can have in the country to the extent that it's a model for other states. This requires motorists to move over a lane or slow down if they see any vehicle at the roadside with its hazards on, including drivers like you or I. I think the difficulty is we know from NHTSA studies, around 30% of drivers say they don't know what the move over law is, they don't know how it works, even when it's that simple. So in all of your communications to your constituents with other governments, Get the word out. It is simple now. Uh, move over a lane. If you see any vehicle, move over a lane. It's always been the right thing to do. Now it's the law. And I can tell you in conversations with state patrol and other law enforcement, they're going to be out there. Um, you know, in the first year, you try to take an education approach first. But whenever we lose someone at the roadside, uh, it becomes a much more enforcement-oriented perspective. 
Thank you very much for that. And I just wanted to echo, I did the tour of the Johnson and Eisenhower tunnels uh, one time with a CCI conference, I believe. And it is fantastic to see how they manage the traffic through that tunnel. You, you just drive through it. You don't think about all of the things that go into ventilation. The cameras they have are absolutely amazing. My wife and I now, whenever we go through the tunnels, we're waving because they're watching us. <laughs> we wave at them, we stick our hands out the window, not our heads, our hands, <laughs> and we wave at them because they, they're, they're watching you. We honk our horns and say hi, and it's great. So it's well worth the, the effort to do that tour. Director Guzman, do you have anything? I just want to open it up for you if you'd have. Thank you, I wasn't ready for that. Um, so RTD's showing up and showing out nationally, um, participating in conferences and all the good stuff. But here locally, we are concerned about um, continued funding for our projects. We've had a, a rough summer, let's just be honest about it, but we are doing the homework that needs to get done to edify our services and strengthen our ability to provide service to all of our constituent areas. And although this summer has not been fun for anybody, by any stretch of the imagination, a great amount of work has gotten done early. A great amount of work has gotten done to ensure that we are in a state of good repair so we can deliver service. At the end of the month, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, we will be reinstating the lines downtown. So right now there's practice runs going on. Be aware when you're walking around Denver that you need to pay attention to those trains running up and down the street again. Do not trespass on the tracks. Keep yourself safe. We want you safe. We want to do everything we can to keep you safe, which includes practicing with the, the train operators to ensure that they are looking out for you, but you also need to look out for the trains and they don't slow down and stop on a dime, you will not win against a train anywhere on this system. The 16th Street Mall is also practicing uh, runs up the new corridor because it started to finally open. Yay, let's go Denver. Um, <laughs> I think everybody's waiting for it. We're also heading into finance season, so be on the lookout because we will have uh, in the coming months the budget available for public review at the Blake Street offices, and we'll be looking for input on that. Thank you. Thank you. Executive Director Johnson, I apologize. I was... Once again, uh, Deborah Johnson, General Mandarin CEO, to elaborate on what Director Guzman was referencing, I want to provide some more context. So he was talking about our near-term rail reconstruction project that we undertook uh, the latter part of May. And the rationale behind that critically important project is due to the fact that our inaugural light rail line opened on October 7th of 1994, hence it's 30 years old. And so with that, with any type of rail undertaking uh, from a capital investment vantage point, you put in rail lines years before they commence with revenue service. And so what we did over the course of the summer, we replaced rail we actually reconstructed because it is subterranean rail unlike what you traditionally would see along our commuter rail corridors where you can I see the uh, rail exposed with ballast and things of the like. It was hard to determine how it had shifted. So um, over the course of the summer, we replaced the rail at five intersections. Uh, Director Guzman was referencing that we completed that work three weeks ahead of schedule on August 29th um, due to the fact that we do work in partnership with uh, various employees that are represented by a collective bargaining agreement. Uh, we just did a bid on work and the rail lines will commence service starting on um, September 29th. However, with the bus routes, we were able, since they were on detour, to ensure that we had the routes resume their pre-project um, uh, um, navigation in the free wall uh, the free mall ride is once again providing connections between Denver Union Station and Civic Center Station so with that as a backdrop the next phase of those projects will commence in the summer where we'll be doing the straightaways as we did the curves relative to the intersections and one thing that's notable talking about 30 years since our inaugural light rail opened in the downtown on October 5th we will be having a celebratory event at 16th and California it's on a Saturday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. where we we can showcase the rail that we actually pulled up. We are actually using that to inform our transit asset management plan so we can actually uh, have 
um, asset information uh, that's matured, recognizing that there's been a myriad of activities that have taken place downtown and the as uh that we had aren't in alignment with what we knew it to be. Uh, something else that's critically important that I like to share that's good news, because oftentimes I'm not here with good news, and so I'm going to stand on it right now. Um, RTD has added live look-in equipment for operator and customer safety, and what I mean by that is we have look-in equipment on all of our bus fleet and 20% on light rail. Um, this technology enhances operator and customer personal security and safety because what it really does, it enables RTD's public safety dispatchers to be able to look into a vehicle in the midst of a moment. So if something is happening, then we can see it in real time. Um, Recognizing that we are in a critical point in history right now, I'm happy to share that the board supported staff's recommendation as relates to zero fare to vote. So we are working in collaboration with the Colorado County's Clerks Association offering two free zero fare days to encourage voter participation. So RTD services will be available at no cost on Tuesday, October 29th. Uh, which is National Vote Early Day, and then on Tuesday, November 5th, Election Day. Additionally, I want to share that um, we have ensured, uh, with the support of the board and the state of Colorado, that our Zero Fair for Youth program is permanent, and it's important to get that word out. And so if, in fact, you had somebody under the age of 19 uh, to benefit from the program, individuals simply need to present a valid student ID or government-issued ID. And then lastly, I'd like to share that um, RTD just underwent a state audit by the Office of the State Auditor, and RTD met all nine of the state's financial health ratios um, as of calendar year 2022. The comprehensive audit reviewed cost efficiency metrics, capital asset projects, budget uh, filing requirements, strategic plan updates, and the onboarding of new board members. So I wanted to share that because oftentimes people question whether or not we're being good fiduciaries, and I think we were validated. So with that, I will yield the floor. Um, I'm sorry? Well, well, FTA Triennial Review. I, so he's referencing uh, RTD is a recipient of federal dollars, and we are eligible for Section 5307 funding. And in that, um, on a triennial basis, the federal government comes in and uses a third party to assess various critical programs, i.e. Uh, disadvantaged business enterprise, how we're doing procurement and contracting, um, whether or not we're doing school busing, which we can't do because we're recipients of federal dollars. So traditionally, um, FTA generally has findings uh, with their common place in contracting and procurement in other areas. Uh, basically, RTD had no deficiencies and three findings out of like 25, but with those three findings, it was uh, updating uh, the materials that we were disseminating in a bulletin form uh, as it relates to um, people that are using service animals and things alike. So I appreciate that, Director Guzman. I take that for granted as par for the course because we are good uh, uh, diligent uh, fiduciary um, steward. So with that, I'll yield the floor. And if there's anything else, uh, Director Broom, if you wanted to share anything. I noticed on 225 this morning that rail cars were going one direction at five miles an hour, and they were going the other direction it looked like 50 miles an hour. So I, I don't know exactly how all those pieces are going to as far as resuming our normal service, that's the question I would. So, please. In reference to the question that you're posing, so there's a myriad of things that are happening in the network this morning. I've been on my phone throughout the course of this meeting. So twofold, um, as we talk about the state of good repair and our responsibility to adhere to our transit asset management plan, RTD had been laser focused on building, 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 and now we're in a state where we are stepping back and we want to ensure that we're investing in all of the infrastructure uh, the taxpayers have entrusted us to build. With that as a backdrop, we have done preventative maintenance inspections. And um, with that, there are some slow speed restrictions. It's commonplace. I happen to be an individual that has been in the public transportation realm for 33 years. And you can look across the country, and in any instance, you will have a uh, rail network that may have a speed restriction. Um, while I recognize it's commonplace, I know it's newer here as I outlined that our system is starting to age. And so with that, we will err on the side of caution. 
Um, additionally, I learned that there was a switch problem this morning, hence Karen Stewart isn't here, and I was coordinating with her uh, because the concessionaires at the U.S. could not get a train in because of a signaling problem. Um, so A-Line is operating, but in-line was having a problem because they have to actually put in a switch, so a bus bridge has been instituted. So perhaps that answers your question, sir. Thank you. Good. All right, uh, we're ready to move on to a report from the Regional Air Quality Council, Director Silverstein. Yes, thank you very much. And, and I wanted to, uh, uh, first of all, thank this committee and, uh, and especially Dr. Cog's staff for the um, TIP amendment that uh, we all voted on um, kind of first thing um, in the meeting. And it, it was, uh, you know, in a large part for the Regional Air Quality Council's um, kind of reapportionment of, um, of funding that we received through Dr. Cog. Um, from CDOT, from eventually, you know, originally Federal Highway Administration. And so, you know, these monies were moved from our vehicle uh, electrification programs that we used to run. Now the state has taken most of those over, and we've moved uh, kind of leftover monies that weren't spent into uh, newer programs at the Regional Air Quality Council for food truck electrification and uh, our clean air auto repair program where we look for high emitting vehicles. and. Um, and help fund the repair of those vehicles when, when owners are either low income or have spent uh, a, a substantial sum already and still can't pass the emissions test. And so those are um, very much appreciated dollars for um, newer programs that we're standing up uh, beginning, this, uh, beginning this year. So again, um, thank you for, to, to this committee for your approval. <clears throat> I know it moves on to the Dr. Cog board. Hopefully we get that same positive result, and, and especially thank you to, to, to the team at Dr. Cog for, for helping us in, in, in this new initiative. Um, summertime ozone season has, um, is coming to a close now. Uh, most of our high days, our high ozone days, occurred during the, um, especially in July, uh, a few in August, um, some in June as well. So that kind of the center of our, of our summer, those hot, dry, um, stagnant days, um, uh, you know, are really our problem areas. So we had a, a tough summer. We had rough, um, uh, rough numbers from an air quality perspective, poor public health. And so we'll continue to work on our efforts to evaluate additional uh, strategies, especially seasonal strategies. Um, we don't need necessarily to have strategies deployed all year long to improve our air quality. So kind of a summertime focus is, um, is an area that we're looking into and um, developing our next air quality plan that's due to, um, to the state about a year from now. So we'll be working on that and I'll, I'll provide updates as, as we go along. And um, finally, um, uh, and I apologize if, if, if many of you didn't receive an invitation already, but um, this evening at the Regional Air Quality Council at our building, we're having our, our, our second annual, what we call Rack Happy Hour. And so it's just an opportunity to thank all of our, of our, our contractors, our staff, our board members, our partners, um, and certain what we call cleaner champions for their efforts in improving air quality and, and helping us at, at our office to, um, to make a difference. And so that's from uh, 4.30 to uh, 7 o'clock this evening. If you have nothing else to do, you need to get a drink after work or, or uh, a bite to eat and join us for our, our celebration this evening. And so thank you. Thank you. I'll open it up to any um events or notifications, anything else for the good of the group? Seeing none, our next meeting will be October 15th. And, oh yeah, sure, Jacob. Okay, yes, yeah, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a couple sets of announcements um, from the Dr. Cog staff side. Um, first, you know, we've already talked about safety this morning. I want to talk about it a little bit more. Um, I want to start by thanking this committee who has always been our safety support and our safety champion. Uh, we're doing several things in the realm of safety and we're going to bring you some more information um, next month, but I wanted to tee up a couple things. Um, we presented to you before, we won a grant from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, NHTSA, um, called the 405C program. It rolls off the tongue. Uh, we've been working on this grant the last two years. It deals with traffic records um, improvement. Um, we have been working to stand up a regional crash data consortium 
Um, we have just finished the draft report of this two years worth of grant work. We are having our final uh, regional cross data consortium grant meeting on Thursday, September 26th at 10 a.m. Um, so if you are interested in that, you are certainly welcome and invited to attend. Um, please um, just let me know and we can forward that invitation to you. Um, some of you know this and maybe some of you don't. We actually work cooperatively with CDOT um, to geolocate or geocode um, the crash data in this region. CDOT does it for what they call their on system, the state and federal highways. Uh, we do it for off system crash data. So all the other roadways within the Dr. Cog region, um, our GIS staff geolocates or geocodes that data each year. And then we work with CDOT to put that together into a combined database that we release on our regional data catalog. Uh, we have just released the 2022 crash data. Uh, so that is a fresh data product that's up there and available um, for use. And then finally, tagging on to that, and this is what we'll present to you next month, uh, Dr. Cog's staff has been working hard on a um, interactive uh, crash data dashboard. Uh, we're really excited about this. I mean, data is only as good as what you can do with it. Um, and so we've been working on this interactive crash data dashboard that has now gone live. We will present it to you next month, but it is available um, on our website for you to be able to really sort of dig into the region's crash data, look at different factors, trends, different types of analysis. Um, so we hope that will be a great tool for the region. So that's one set of announcements for me. The other announcement for me, um, I'm very pleased to announce, we just found this out this morning. Um, Dr. Cog has won a discretionary grant from the U.S. Department of Transportation's Build America Bureau, um, and an innovative finance and asset concessionaire grant um, geared towards five of our bus rapid transit corridors that are in our regional transportation plan uh, that we discussed earlier this morning. Um, this grant is just under a million dollars and it will help us advance some of the pre-construction work, the planning and project development work um, associated with several of those corridors um, that are in our plan. So we're really excited about that. Also want to congratulate the city of Denver, RTD, um, and the State Department of Personnel, um, per Personnel and Finance, I believe, who also won uh, Build America Bureau grants under this program. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Good news. We're always willing to um, extend the meeting for a few minutes for, for good news. By the way, if you did park downstairs in the covered parking, Cam right here, who is, uh, I just have to say, is fantastic at setting these meetings up and, and assisting me during this. I apologize for any mangling of names. I apologize for that. But if you need a parking pass, then the guy to go see. Thank you and we're adjourned. <laughs>